God loves you and He likes you. We know this because His Son, Jesus, died for your sins and rose to give you eternal life with Him. This is the good news that empowers us for our mission, to love our neighbors in word and deed like God has loved us, to unite us in worship like He's united us to Himself and to one another across everything that might divide us, and to transform our neighborhoods and the nations. That's what we're all about at Cornerstone Church, Irmo. And this is a podcast for those who want to share in the sermons that equip us for this mission, but can't be with us in person. And as you find your seat, if you'll find your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 3, I'll go grab my Bible. (laughs) Exodus chapter 3. If you're using the Bible in the pew rack, the regular print is page 46, the large print Bible is page 54. When we last saw Moses, which was last week, the end of chapter 2, he was 40 years old. He had fled from Egypt, you'll remember. He had found a new home in the wilderness in Midian. And he had started a family. He had a a wife that he had met and married there, Zipporah. They had started a family, and he started a new career as a shepherd of all things, which was a profession that was loathed, looked down on by the Egyptians who had raised Moses. But now 40 years have passed. So there's a gap of 40 years between the end of chapter 2 and verse 1 of chapter 3. And Moses is now about 80 years years old at this point. So keep that in mind as we read. Another thing to to maybe keep in mind as we get into this really very famous passage is maybe you'll remember, you know, every Christmas we, we think about those shepherds, remember, who are out in the field watching their flocks by night when a bright light accompanied God's announcement of his gracious salvation. Well, it happened here first. So let's give our attention to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now Moses was keeping his flock, the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked And behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God. 
on this mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, your word is a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Your word is fire. Lord, your word is truth. Where else can we go but to you? You alone have the words of life. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, you would come and speak to us through your word and to our hearts and apply it, make it real, make it alive. Lord, make us real and alive to your gospel call. Lord, we pray that you would do your work among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is is a really powerful and a really pivotal scene here in Exodus, And, and, and right away, we might have a few questions about what, what's going on before we get to the heart of the text. The first question is maybe, okay, so what is this mountain? It says in verse 1 that, that Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And a little bit later, we're going to learn another name for this same mountain, Sinai. It's the same mountain. Um, now, there, where is this mountain? We don't know. There are a few educated guesses of where it might be somewhere in the vast wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. But sometimes places in the Bible do have double names or even names that maybe change over time. And so that's no different here. The mountain can be called Horeb and later known as Mount Sinai. It's, it's true for people too, right? Because we also saw uh, Moses' father-in-law was earlier in chapter 2 called Ruel or Ruel, and here he's called Jethro, and that's kind of the name that we hear most of the time, although Ruel comes back a little bit later. Same guy, different names. But calling Horeb the mountain of God here is interesting too. Um, that, I don't think that necessarily means that Moses or anyone else knew it as the mountain of God at this point in the story. This is more written, you know, in retrospect, looking back, after all the events that would happen. Because what's going to happen as we get further on into Exodus is God will indeed, working through Moses, bring his people back to this very point, to this very mountain, where he's going to have a very dramatic meeting with all of the Israelites, with all of God's people gathered there. And he's going to make a gracious covenant with them and hand down the Ten Commandments. So, so that, that's the kind of the question of the mountain. Another question we might have right off the bat here is, who is this angel of the Lord? It says there in verse 2, if you look at it, it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses there in the fire. And so we might be wondering, okay, well, well is this an angel or, or is this God? And it actually helps if, if we, like a good Israelite, have been reading up through Genesis up to this point, and we've been paying careful attention And now we're coming through Exodus, and we're supposed to think, you know, I'm starting to recognize a pattern here. This sounds kind of familiar, because it is. Several times in Genesis, we see the same pattern where a human-like figure or a divine messenger or an angel of the Lord turns out to be the very presence of God himself with his people. So back in, in Genesis 16, we meet Hagar, who was Abraham and Sarah's servant. And she met the angel of the Lord also out in the wilderness, and it turned out that the angel of the Lord was the Lord himself. In Genesis 22, Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain, but he was stopped, you remember, by an angel of the Lord, which turned out to be the Lord himself. Then in Genesis 32, Jacob, who wrestled with this human-like figure, says he wrestled with a man Um, that Jacob didn't know exactly who this was, but then as as Jacob is limping away afterward, as the the day has dawned, he later recognizes it was God himself. Jacob himself said in Genesis 32, he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. So all that's to say, it's not very surprising then this pattern holds here. So we come to to, to verse 2 and it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And then look down to verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside, who called to him? God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And, And so then what happens next is really significant. 
God is going to reveal three things to Moses, and that's going to set really the trajectory, these three things, for the rest of Exodus and really set the trajectory for the rest of the Bible. So these three things are actually going to be our three headings today, and then we're going to kind of tie it up and look at how it applies at the very end. Um, So three things, you'll be relieved, no doubt to know, they all start with the letter P. (laughs) You, um, you know, you would think that, that there's like a whole class that we take in seminary on alliteration. We really don't. I don't know why. Yeah, we just really love it. So thanks for bearing with me. But God reveals to Moses three things. They do all start with the letter P. And he reveals them to us too. So we're going to see God's person, his purpose, and his presence. His person, his purpose, and his presence. And after we look at each one of those, like I said, in turn... We'll wrap up by seeing a really fascinating way that this points to Jesus and also how that applies very practically to us right here and right now. But we're going to spend a little more, bit more time on the first P up front. God reveals to Moses and to us his person. His person. See, God is about to do something significant. He's about to send Moses out on his mission. But first... He has to bolster Moses' confidence. Not not confidence in himself, not confidence in Moses, no. But confidence in the God who is sending him. So God reveals his character, his person to him. In particular, two ways he reveals that to him. He reveals his holiness and his faithfulness. As God reveals his person, specifically he reveals his holiness and his faithfulness. But first look at his holiness. Look at verse 4. When the Lord saw that he that Moses had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. It seems like God calls people a lot twice. I don't know if you've noticed that. Jacob, Jacob. Um, there's, there's a way of, you know, if you're in a crowd, maybe you, you hear your name like, Tim. Like, did, did I hear my name? or something? So maybe a second time is like, no, someone is really calling you. I, that's complete speculation, but it seems like he's like Moses, Moses for emphasis. It says, and then he said, Moses said, here I am. Verse 5, then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Our house um, isn't really a take off your shoes when you come in the door house, but, but a lot of houses are. Um, And I don't know, maybe we should be, you know, maybe we could be, we don't care as much as we should about germs and and dirt, it's it's a fair point. But I think we all, whether you're a take off your shoes at the front door or not kind of household, we would all agree that if you had someone who was maybe doing some work at your house, maybe a plumber or a construction worker, if they came stomping through your house with muddy boots on, you would be within your rights to be offended, right? Right? I think all of us would be. That's that's disrespectful to us, disrespectful to our home. Along the same lines, I think we all can understand that the, the, the converse is also true, that taking off your shoes in a way is a sign or can be a sign of respect and honor. And that's exactly what this is. In the ancient Near East, um, it was indeed a sign of humility and reverence to take off your shoes, to take off your sandals. And it's, that's true still today in many parts of the world culturally. And so God tells Moses to take off his sandals. Why? Because he is standing on holy ground. He is in the presence of a holy God. Now, the Bible uses the word holy a lot especially here in Exodus. It didn't come up a whole lot in Genesis, but now we get to Exodus, we're going to start seeing holiness a lot. And we're going to see it as we get going further on into Exodus too. But just know that this is such a key description of God's self-revelation of who He is that we don't want to rush past this. Holy means set apart. It means morally set apart. So from all those who are not morally perfect and righteous, God is morally perfect and righteous. So he is set apart from everything else which isn't perfect. But he's also just set apart and completely other. 
He is that one uncreated being, the uncreated creator. He is the one who has no beginning and no end. God is wholly other. And so throughout, not just Exodus, throughout the scriptures, we read that God is set apart. He is perfect. He is holy. As he says to the prophet Hosea in Hosea 11, I am God and not man, the holy one among you. And as Hannah prayed in 1 Samuel 2, there is none holy like the Lord. One of the the symbols of that holiness we see here, that prominent figure that's our little graphic for the sermon series, it's fire, right? Fire is a symbol of, of holiness. Fire is purity, it's powerful, fire purifies, right? It also has a way, if it's unchecked, it's powerful, it will destroy. And yet it's remarkable that even God in his holiness is able to burn with purity, with power in a bush, and yet control it. The bush is burning and yet not consumed. And we see fire, this fire imagery, actually accompanying God's presence throughout the Bible. You remember back with when God made a covenant with Abram back in, in Genesis 12. And he comes and it says there's a, um, there, he passes through these cut open animals in the form of a flaming torch and a smoking fire pot. God's presence to Abram as he made a covenant with him was one of fire. Soon fire is going to cover not just this bush, on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, it's going to cover the entire mountain when, when God's people come and Moses gathers them around the mountain and God makes a covenant with his people. And then it's going to be fire that we see in the form of a pillar of fire that guides God's people through the wilderness for the next 40 years after he delivers them from Egypt. A pillar of fire by night and a pillar of uh, or a fire by night and smoke by day. But God's fire, his holiness, is going to be represented in fire in all kinds of ways throughout Exodus. But it doesn't even stop there. We see this fire imagery throughout the Old Testament all the way until we come to the New Testament. And where do we see it again? At the very beginning of the New Testament church. It's really interesting. You remember how the first Christians, remember, had gathered after Jesus had ascended and they were waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And what did it look like? It was fire, right? It was tongues of fire that came and rested on each one of those first Christians. And we now, today as God's people, we are like that burning bush in a way that Moses saw. We're, we're empowered and sent on mission to the nations because we're filled with God's spirit of holiness, his Holy Spirit. We're burning but not consumed. As Paul puts it in Romans 12, we right now are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship, our our spiritual service. So we understand why Moses at this point in verse 6 says he instantly hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. At first, initially, Moses had been, been attracted to the sight of the burning bush. He'd been curious about this voice speaking to him from out of the fire in the bush. But as soon as he realized more fully who this was, this was the God of his father, the God of his forefathers. This was the God of Israel, who is utter purity, the burning holiness of the one who made the universe. He hides his face in fear. So there's there's something that's both terrifying and, and attractive at, at the same time about this God. I love how one commentator, uh, Christopher Wright, puts it this way. He says, God's presence and God's holiness seem like the opposite poles of the magnet working together. Pull and push. Come close, but keep your distance. It's a theme that will occur often in Old Testament history. I would just say this, if, if you're here in this room or, 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 or watching online or listening to this later on the podcast, um, even if you're not sure where you stand with Christianity, um, you're not sure what you think about God, about whether any of this is even true, I just, at this point, I'd like to at least humbly suggest to you that you want a God who is like this. Deep down, if you're honest, 
You really want this to be true. And I understand there are further steps to say, well, well then is it true? And, and we would love to talk with you more about how we know that it is. But I would just start here and say you want a God who is holy, who cannot possibly sin. We want, we, we need a God to exist who is utterly immune to being contaminated with even the tiniest speck of, of sin, of, of injustice, of unrighteousness. Because we see the opposite all around us, right? A- and in ourselves. We see people in every earthly position of authority fail and fall on almost a daily basis. We see politicians who can be bought, bosses who steal and cheat, pastors who abuse their spiritual authority, fathers who hurt. But the reason that we all know how wrong those things are is because we just intuitively know that there has to be a standard by which we can judge those broken and sinful leaders against, right? So without such a God, without a perfect, holy God, we have no standard by which to critique those who get it wrong. Does that make sense? And then, and this is the interesting next step, at the same time, I think not only do we want and need the standard, the existence of a perfectly holy God, But we also have another deep longing that maybe it might sound contradictory at first, but it actually really dovetails perfectly. A God that's not just holy, but also a God who is close and loving and nurturing. But but this holy God, like Moses, we dare not draw near to such a perfectly holy God because we know our own failures, right? What do impurities do in the face of fire? They are burned up. And yet we can't live without a God who keeps his distance or who only draws near in judgment. That is utterly terrifying. And so here in this passage, we get really powerful hints that this God, the true God of the universe, not just of Israel, of the universe, is both unapproachable in holiness and beckoning us to draw near to him in his covenant faithfulness. And so that's where where God reveals not just his holiness, but also the person of his faithfulness, his faithfulness, which is really just another way of saying he keeps his promises to his covenant people. You see it in verse 6, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. He says, I am the God of your father. Now, that's interesting. That's singular. The God of your father. And we later learn the name of Moses' father. We, we've heard about him referenced earlier in chapter 1 of Exodus. But we learn later his, his name is Amram, and, and Moses' mother was named Jochebed. But, of course, you remember that, that they, through a, a amazing conniving and really wisdom, they outfoxed the fox, Pharaoh, and preserved baby Moses, and were able to, to be paid to raise him and nurture him in the ways of the Lord at a young age. Before then, he was turned back over to the Egyptian, uh, the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, who then raised him in the Egyptian royal court as her own son. And so God is not just holy, he's personal, is the point. More specifically, he's the holy personal God who makes and keeps covenant promises to his people by name. He reveals himself to Moses as, his, I'm the faithful one. I'm the God of your father that you remember, Amram. He says, I'm the one who was faithful, the covenant-keeping God to Amram. I'm, I'm the one who was faithful to his and your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who you would have grown up hearing so much about Moses as a young child. He said, I make solemn promises. I made a solemn promise to Abraham, and I promised that I would make a a mighty nation out of him, an elderly barren man, Abraham and Sarah, and out of them I would also bring them, as a great nation, into a land, a good land that they would call their own. That's what God says there. You see in verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. God is a promise-making, promise-keeping 
God. He gives Moses, in a sense, his credentials up front in a way so that, so that Moses will be emboldened for the task that he's about to give him. And that brings us to our second thing that God reveals about himself. Not only his person and his holiness and faithfulness, but secondly, God's purpose. What is that purpose? It is very clear. This purpose of God is to send Moses on a God-sized mission. This holy God of Israel, the one true God, is ascending God. And here he commissions his servant Moses to go. Moses is going to become the prophet of God, the sent one, who is really going to form the pattern for all the other prophets that would come after him. All the, the, throughout the rest of the Bible, these servants of God who were sent to speak God's words and to save God's people. But Moses here is the prophet, prophet par excellence. That is, really, until we reach the crescendo of the Scripture and we come to the New Testament. And Jesus himself, God in human flesh, would come and say, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Look down at verse 9. God says, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God commissions Moses for this big, God-sized, covenant-keeping mission of getting his people out of where they don't belong, under the oppressive yoke of, of slavery and where they do belong into the land that God had promised all along he would bring them to. But Moses isn't quite convinced yet, right? This, this is a lot for a guy to take in. So we, we have a lot of sympathy for Moses. And you see it in verse 11. Moses said to him, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And you hear the, just the... The fear, the incredulity in Moses. And, and at this point, I do think sometimes we're too quick to, to judge Moses. Um, when, when we get a little further into this conversation, the more Moses keeps kind of balking and making excuses, God starts to get a little frustrated with him. But right here, I think God, there's no hint that God is impatient or frustrated with Moses that he's sinning in any way when he says, who am I? If anything, this is appropriate humility. It makes sense that Moses would look around and like, who, me? <laughs> Moses is at this point entering the third, the final third of his life. We know from, from the book of Deuteronomy that Moses is going to live to the ripe old age of 120. And it's interesting, his life really is very neatly compartmentalized into three major equal-sized chapters of his life, 40 years each. For the first 40 years, Moses is raised in the Egyptian royal court, even though he did have those foundational early years with his birth family, learning about the God of Israel. Now, from, from, uh, verse, from ages 40 to 80, he was just a nomadic shepherd in Midian. He married Zipporah. He had two sons. We'll find out about the other son a little bit later. Um, at Gershom, Gershom and Eleazar was the name of their names. But now at this point, he's 80 years old. And God is commissioning him to be God's prophet, his, his mouthpiece, his deliverer. So God shows Moses his person, his holiness, his faithfulness, his purpose, his, his mission that he's sending him on. And finally, God's presence goes with him. He says in verse 12, he said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So God promises his presence with Moses. It's, it's a part of who God is, his covenant faithfulness, that he promises to go with him. He is, as we, we find later in the scriptures, he is known by the name Emmanuel, God with us. And you can see how, how comforting that is. That if this holy God is with me, not in judgment, but in grace, then yes, if he's sending me on this mission, don't make me do it by myself. You want 
a strong and gracious God, not just sending you, but going with you on this mission. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, no, it was actually last week. We were walking in the park, Seven Oaks Park, and I had just gotten this set of, this disc golf set. And so I was out of the big field, and I was like, I'm going to just practice kind of figuring out how to, you know, how they go. And, and I thought, okay, it's going to hook to the left, so I, but I overcompensated. I threw it, and it went to the right. It landed in, over the fence in someone's backyard. And, and maybe you remember doing this as a kid. I do where, you know, you accidentally lose a ball or a Frisbee over your neighbor's fence, and, and, you know, maybe they have a dog. They did have a dog, and so I had to go around and ring the doorbell, and so I was like, I'm not climbing over. But maybe you remember that yourself, and you think, maybe you were too young and shy to, to go to retrieve it yourself to talk to these strangers, these neighbors. So you went and told your mom or your dad what happened, and they said, well, go just ring the doorbell and ask for it back. You're feeling shy, but listen, this is, this is the point when finally your tension releases and your shoulders, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief. When, when your mom says, do you want me to go with you? <laughs> right? That gives you more confidence. You're like, yes, please. And then you go and you ring the door and you get your, your Frisbee back or whatever it is. God assures Moses that he's going to go with them in this really difficult but absolutely crucial mission. God's presence, in fact, going with him, would make such an impression on Moses throughout his whole life that even at the very end, 120 years old, he's about to die and pass on the baton to Joshua. They're going to go in and take, take control of the promised land. This is what Moses tells him in Deuteronomy 31. He says, Be strong and courageous, Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. This pattern, God revealing his person to us, his his credentials in a sense, who he is, his his missional purpose for his people, and, and also his promise of his presence with us, this pattern actually repeats multiple times throughout the Old Testament, until it builds to a crescendo again when we come to the New Testament and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the sent one, the one sent by God the Father, who is now sending his disciples, that is us, his followers, on a mission to seek and to save the lost of the nations until he comes again. We heard it earlier read today, but I want to invite you, if you have your Bible open, to flip over to the New Testament to Matthew's Gospel, and we're going to close with this. Matthew 28, if you have a pew Bible, if the regular print 835, large print 993. It's a very famous passage in Christian circles, if you've been around with us or another church you've grown up with. We call it the Great Commission. We see the same pattern played out here. Not just in this, well, isn't that an interesting parallel? This is our commission too. It says in in verse 16 of Matthew 28, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain on which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that interesting? Worship at a mountain. But we have that first point that we saw God reveals his person, Jesus said, his credentials in a sense. Verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, here's who I am. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's who he is. He reveals his person. Secondly, he goes on to reveal his purpose, his sending them and us out on God's worldwide mission. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, isn't that interesting? In Exodus, uh, God, uh, Moses was sent to bring a message of freedom and then to, to bring God's people to a promised land. Now, Jesus tells his people to all go out into all the land and all the earth and to bring a message of freedom. That's the gospel on the move. God sends us out This mission is still for us today. And then finally, we see his presence because Jesus says, 
Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That means until Jesus comes again, these are, in a sense, our marching orders of going out, yes, to the nations, but also of being his ambassadors, his, his witnesses to those who we come in contact every day. Every single one of us is called to be on this mission, empowered by his presence. And we're going to have actually a really practical way of thinking about that together as a church during the months of June and July. Maybe you've noticed on the front of our worship guide every week, we, we have our mission statement written there. We're going to be doing a class. Joshua has been working hard to put together what we're going to do in our Sunday school time during the months of June and July, looking through bit by bit our mission. We're calling it Every Member Mission. What we want to do is think practically what is the Great Commission, this call, not only where Moses sets a pattern and brings his people out, but, but we are commissioned by Jesus to go and to compel the nations to come in. What does it look for, like for us, very practically, to, to put this into place here at Cornerstone? And so we want to think through how we're, we're motivated by the gospel and our mission is, and this is, you see it right there, to love our neighbors in word and deed, to unite together in worship, and to go out to transform our neighborhoods and the nations. So we'll have about a half hour of, of kind of teaching time and then a half hour of gr grouping up and talking or discussing or little projects together, making this very practical and hands-on for everyone. Because God promises his gracious presence with us, we can, we can rest in him. He, he doesn't just send us out on our own, but he goes with us and he empowers us by his gospel. May God add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we see this mission that you had for Moses, and it was utterly impossible if left up to him. And Lord, we see how you also have called us and, and empowered us to go and to share the gospel with our neighbors, to love them in Yes, in our words, with the words of the gospel message, but, but also with our hands and our feet and, and loving people well and learning how to listen and ask good questions. And uh, Lord, we pray in all these things that you would indeed go with us, that you would empower us by your grace and encourage us that as we go and step out of our comfort zones, whatever that might look like in our, in our daily walk, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us, that you go with us the grace of your presence. We thank you for the gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Pastor Joshua Knott from Cornerstone Church, Irmo. We really hope that God uses the content of this podcast, this particular sermon in your life. If you were helped in any way spiritually by this, would you take a minute and review our podcast or share this particular message to help us get the word out? If you're able to contribute to the ministry of Cornerstone Church, you can check the link embedded in this particular podcast to find out how to give. And we hope to see you soon face to face.